can you say and spell your name and let us know what your title is? Uh, yeah. yeah, my name is Sarah Galata. It's S A R A H and G U L O T T A. Uh, and my position here at Highwire is I'm a production brewer. Awesome. So today is Thursday, June 28th. Correct. And uh, we're at Highwire Brewing in Asheville, um, North Carolina. So to start, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Your background and where you're from um, and things like that. I'm originally from a place called Dinetown, Pennsylvania. It's just outside of Philly. So uh, I'm a hardcore Philadelphia, any sports fanatic. <laughs> Go Eagles. <laughs> Um, I grew up right outside of Philly in a town called Dinetown. That's actually where Victory Brewing is. I grew up about a mile from that brewery. I uh, grew up there. I went to, first time I went to college, I went to University of Virginia and I got my Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and, but I also studied music and Russian while I was there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, after college, I uh, went back to Philly for a little bit, and then I moved out to Oregon, which is where I got into beer, and now I'm here in Asheville. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about how you got into beer. Okay. Uh, so while I was at University of Virginia, um, I actually really got into wine. Uh, I think probably because I grew up so close to Victory, I I was drinking I was drinking good beer in high school. <laughs> we weren't drinking, you know, rock gut stuff. Right. Uh, I was drinking craft beer. The first craft, the first beer I ever had was Golden Monkey from Victory. So I already had a very high level of what good beer was. And so when I got to college and everyone's drinking like Natty Light and Beast and all that crap, uh, I didn't like it. And so um, I, I think it pushed me more towards wine. There's so many amazing vineyards around Charlottesville. So it wasn't just drinking wine; it was harassing these poor vendors, telling me what they do. <laughs> uh, so when I graduated, I originally thought I wanted to go into special education, and I kind of decided that may not be for me. So I moved to Oregon, like just kind of picked up and left, thinking I was going to get into the Pinot Noir industry out in Oregon. Um, again, I just kind of went out there without a plan, <laughs> and the first job that landed in my lap was actually at Rogue, I, just in their tap room and in their tasting room. Um, literally the night I, that's in a little town called Newport on the coast. Um, the night I went there to go get a beer, I walked out with a job. So it was pretty cool. Um, so once I started learning about beer, I was like, oh, this is so much more interesting than wine. <laughs> <laughs> I really fell in love with beer and just Rogue makes a lot of different types. So I was able to really learn and get, really start to figure out what I liked in beer, what was really interesting. Um, so I knew I wanted to start making it and stop serving it. Uh, right at that time, my sister opened a restaurant here, right outside Asheville here, called Louise's Kitchen. She's like, hey, there's a lot of beer in Asheville. Why don't you move out here, see what happens? And as soon as I got here, they started the uh, brewing program at AB Tech. Uh, like within a month, it was announced as soon as I got here. So I figured it was perfect timing. So I went back to school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, the program at AB Tech? Yeah. Um, it, I was the first class. So oh, wow. it, we were the guinea pigs a little bit. Um, at the time, it was really just, we basically just had one brewmaster, our teacher. Uh, they would have a couple adjuncts every one out in. It's actually grown a lot since then. Now they have several teachers and my old brewmaster is now just in charge of stuff like it's really grown but we were definitely the initial guinea pigs and it's a really well-rounded program it's not just focused on production even though that's a really strong component of it um, sales is also really important marketing uh, beer law um, just learning every aspect of the beer industry so it's really great for anyone not even if you just want to be a production brewer like I am. Um, a couple of my friends have gone to sales uh, distribution here at Skyland. They're doing great. They love it. Uh, many of us have gone on to be brewers, but it's definitely not the only option, which I think is important. Uh, education is becoming so much more important for the beer industry in general. 10, 15 years ago, you could just walk into a brewery and like, you know, kind of intern there and eventually work your way through and have no experience whatsoever uh 
that's getting harder nowadays. You can, but it's going to take you a really long time to get to the position even that I'm at. Yeah. Um, having your education background now, it'll help you get a sales job. It'll help you become a brewer so much faster. And that's what breweries, now that this is a common thing, this beer education, now breweries are expecting that. Um, so it was definitely a good choice for me to pursue. Yeah. And when was it that you, when was the program? Uh, let's see, I graduated three years ago. So I must have started in 2013. And okay. it's a two year program with a summer internship in between. Um, that summer internship is so important. Uh, I mean, we actually uh, always take summer interns from the AB Tech program. Uh, we find that the interns we get from them are always fantastic. They're always great. Uh, but that internship is so important because it really will show you whether this is it for you or not. Um, we have had interns come in and they can't cut it. Um, you know, if you don't, if you're not okay with washing kegs for eight hours, it, you know what? We all had to do it. We all have to do it still. It's not, I'm not above doing it right now. Like you just, it has to get done. And if you, it just takes a certain work ethic and having these internships were, that was absolutely the most important thing, at least for me, because it yeah. taught me that I, I can put up with this stuff <laughs> and I what still like it. What did you do for your internship? Um, I interned at a really small brewery out in Black Mountain called Lookout. Mm. Um, when I started interning there, we were brewing on um, a Sabco system. While I, was, while I was interning there, they moved up to a three barrel and it was like me up to me and like one other intern to kind of like figure out how to work it. I mean, it was very, we had to do a lot on our own and we had to figure it out on our own. Um, but it was, that was really helpful. Um, sometimes really getting your butt kicked, that's what you need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what kind of resources, even from AB Tech, but also since, yeah. do you kind of lean on to grow as a brewer, to learn? Um, one of the main things and that I got out of the program is actually now I do have this network of people that went through the program with me. Um, like one example, uh, a really good friend of ours, Sam, he used to work for Catawba. Every once in a while, he would run out of BioFine, so he could call us and he could come down and pick up BioFine. Or if for some reason we're having an issue of, with yeast, I can call any number of people and we're not screwed for the day. I can go get yeast. We can continue. Our Everyone wants to help each other out, and especially coming out of that program. We all want our friends to succeed and do well because honestly, I just want to drink good beer. So if they're making good beer, then everything's going great. Um, so definitely just coming out of school already with a network was great. Um, another network that I'm actually kind of newer to is the Pink Boot Society, um, especially within Asheville. Uh, on, online, if you have a question, you can just post it. Uh, women from all over the country or actually all over the world can answer it, help you out. It's just women helping women, which is fantastic. That's definitely a big resource as well. Um, I think I... I was kind of shied away from the Pink Boot Society for a little bit because I, I sort of struggled with the idea of like, well, if I'm a woman, if I'm a woman in this industry, like, why do I have to draw attention to it? Like, if I'm actually equal, do I, do I need to make it a big deal? I don't know. I, I kind of just struggled with that concept. I was like, well, maybe I should just try and figure out the best way to word it. For some reason, I thought maybe blending into the background was going to be the easiest way for me to look like I was just a part of the industry. Mm -hmm. But now I'm realizing women still aren't there yet. So to be out on the forefront is actually more necessary. So I, it took me a while to kind of learn that and come to terms with that. But now that I am, I'm like, oh, yeah, women brewers, pink booth society. Let's just get all seven with it. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and we'll, we'll come back to pink booths yeah. in a few minutes. But um, so you... Are there specific people who kind of stand out along the way who you maybe see as a mentor or who have particularly helped you out um, along the way? My, our brewmaster uh, from AB Tech, his name's Jeff Irvin. Uh, everyone calls him Puff, uh, lovingly. Um, I, re I, I just remember one of the first things you're like taught in class or what he said to us is like, I'm going to ruin beer for you. And <laughs> because now I do think about it so critically. And 
mostly him kind of teaching me like that's okay you should be critical you should not just go along with things you should question everything he's still a resource today if I have an issue I'll call him uh, he has a general attitude that I kind of admire just kind of get your shit done and have fun or, I don't know just like uh, I kind of looked up to him a lot um, just an overall really good guy uh, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so you've been brewing professionally since 20, uh, 2015. 15? Uh-huh. Um, it's only been three years, but there have been massive changes. Oh, yeah. Here and industry-wide. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those changes that you've seen just on the brewing side? Not even just kind of the community side, but just beer and beer styles. Well, first of all, it does still blow my mind that, I mean we're still opening breweries with, <laughs> even with an I and just like it kind of blows I'm like you're you're really you're gonna open another one but it still works it's still going um obviously the there's all there's always going to be some trend um I think when I first started brewing here it was when sessions were really starting to take hold um and sours have always been kind of building a little bit <laughs> um of course now the trend is the hazy IPA you're always going to have the trend, um, and there are some breweries that really kind of hitch their wagon to the trends. I'm really happy to see a lot of breweries are starting to take a little bit more care in their in the classics. Like for here at Highwire, we do our lager and our brown. Like those those are my two favorite beers that we make. Um, like you said at Carly at Bull Missy, she's doing her brown is fucking spectacular um because trends will come and go but like people are always going to want a good lager they're always going to want a good brown um ipa is starting to get like i mean i miss the west coast ipa like no one no one around here is making that often uh men not as well as i can get it on the west coast so you know it's just kind of these cl more classic style beers that i as beer drinkers are becoming more knowledgeable about beer in general, I think that's going to lead to more people appreciating the simpler styles, but they're the hardest to make and they're just so good, they'll never go out of style. Yeah. So I'm glad to see that despite all the trends, those things are still holding strong and still holding popular. Um, but. I think just the amount of growth is just so massive. I mean, we're about to open our third tap room out in Durham. We just re announced that uh, last week. Um, and now you're getting to the point where there's not only more breweries opening up, but you also have more breweries having more tap rooms. We, uh, it's just, the growth has just been exponential. And right, at least Asheville, I think, is starting to become a little saturated. I think it's gonna start leading to some, I think it's actually gonna make people make better beer. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that it's made people have to step up their game. Um, and I think that's just going to continue. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's talk about Highwire. Yeah. <laughs> I love Highwire. So, what initially kind of attracted you to the position here? What led you here? I knew that I wanted to work for Highwire when I graduated. Um, I didn't even apply anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> um, my then boyfriend, now husband, he's a sellerman here. Uh, back when Highwire was just starting out um, and this so this was before we started school we yeah. met in school me and my husband uh, when, when did Highwire Highwire started in 2000 or oh, around 5th so 2012 2013 That's what I was thinking. Um, so right when it was open uh, we actually started in the only brewery to fail in Asheville um, it was called Craggy and uh, didn't <laughs> That it was the only brewery to fail here in Asheville. Uh, so uh, the guys from Highwire took over the space. Um, they actually kept on one of the old brewers from Craggy because he knew how to work everything. Um, and so that brewer, his name's Luke. My my husband's ex-girlfriend used to live above Luke, and he would literally stalk Luke. Like Luke would take his dog out to go pee. My my husband would take his dog out, and be like, "Hey, here you're starting a brewery." So uh, he basically stalked Luke until Luke gave him uh, an internship, an unpaid internship. And at the time, you know, John was preparing to go to school like I was. And uh, they were like, well, why don't you just stay on? Don't go to school. We'll hire you. And 
he was like, you know what, I think in the long run, getting an education, this is going to be better. So he left. But Highwire kind of told him, as soon as you're done, come to us, we'll give you a job. Mm -hmm. So when John and I both graduated, I got to know the guys from Highwire really well because of that, because of that relationship. And uh, Highwire was just opening this facility. So this was 2015. Highwire was just opening this facility, um, expanding from... Uh, Let's see, I think our first year we were at almost 10,000 barrels a year and that was probably like triple production from before. Uh, yeah, it, it jumped up pretty quick. And so he got hired on here as, as a sellerman. Um, they were still putting the bottling line together and so they weren't ready for to hire anybody else quite yet. So I was like, I will take anything that you will give me. And so uh, they were like, we have like a tour guide position that's gonna be like, one day a week I was like I'll fucking do it <laughs> sounds great and I just got my foot in the door welcome to Highwire <laughs> what initially attracted you to the position here um I knew I wanted to work for Highwire when I graduated actually before I graduated um my husband had a really strong relationship with Highwire he interned here actually before uh like right when Highwire was starting to become a thing when they were just one uh one location small brewery um he uh stalked the head brewer uh, he, he used to live above him and so every time the head would take his dog out my <laughs> husband would take his dog out and stalk him and so he interned here unpaid for about nine months before uh, we started school um, and Highwire initially was like don't go to school come work for us and but my husband wanted to get his degree as did I uh, so when he graduated Highwire was like we'll, we'll hire you right off the bat so he kind of knew he was walking into a job right when he graduated um, just from getting to know all of the folks here through my husband, I, I just really liked the culture and I knew I really wanted to work for them. I knew they were going in a really great direction. Um, I loved that their base, their flagships were a lager, a brown, an IPA, like the classics that I love, but they weren't afraid to do weird shit too. Um, so I always liked the direction they were going in. It's also, they, I, I'm very visually, uh, Stimulated, so they're, they have the they always had the prettiest labels and the best marketing. So they suckered me in. Uh, so like I said, I knew I wanted to work for them. I didn't apply anywhere else. Um, when I graduated, they were opening this facility that we're at now, the Big Top. Um, the bottling line was still getting up and running. They were still even trying to get the brew house up and running. So they weren't ready to hire people. The only position open was a tour guide position, like on Saturdays from like one to three. And I was like fuck it, I'll take it, sounds great. Because I knew I could get my foot in the door, and I did, and I did that for a month. And a month later, our um, operations manager, Ben, was like, hey, I need someone on the bottling line. So then I did work on the bottling line for about a year, and then uh, came time to move up to the brew house. Um, so I definitely paid, moved up through high wire. I started at the very, very bottom and I moved up to a production brewer. Um, I don't know. I, I always felt really proud of that. And I did that. I went from tour guide to brewer in two years. So I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what do you, how would you say, what is, what would you say is the main mission for high wire? High wire's purpose. Our mission is to not, Beer's supposed to be fun, not take ourselves so serious. That's why it's a freaking circus. That's why there's a tiger behind me right now. <laughs> it should be fun. You can, Highwire completely, completely embodies the idea that you can take the science of making beer seriously without taking yourself too seriously. I think that can be kind of an issue with a lot of breweries nowadays. They're kind of, you know, it's starting to get all hoity-toity and, you know, get your nose. Beer is supposed to be fun. Um, so it's making beer accessible. Uh, our lager, um, it's, it's a simple lager. It's a German-style lager. But if we have someone come in that's drank Bud Light their whole life, they can still drink something here. It shouldn't be something that is exclusive. Um, it's making craft beer accessible. Um, so we, here at this production brewery, we really focus on our flagships, our, our brown, a session IPA, an IPA, and our lager, obviously. We have a very strong lagering program. Um, we, the best beer that we make here, my favorite beer of all time, is our Oktoberfest. It's called Zirkus Fest. We actually won a gold medal for it at GABF in 2016. 
Um, it's the best beer. I started drinking. I was like brewing it two weeks ago. I'm like, I just want to drink it. It's so good. Let's talk about the process of brewing that one. Okay. What goes into it? Ah, uh, that one. Uh, so we use um, we use German Waterman malts for that one. I mean, it's mostly Pilsner, but we also use our Munich. Um, actually, when we so if when you win uh, a gold medal at GABF with uh, Waterman's malts, they send you these like bright red overalls with like the Waterman thing on it. They said that it's like too small. They don't fit like anyone here. I think they fit like our super skinny like brewer. But like we just have them hanging like on a rack back there. It looks like Mario got raptured. Like yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, it is a uh, just a really nice multi beer. It um, gets lagered for eight weeks. Uh, it takes a lot of care. That's the thing. A lot of craft breweries are hesitant to make lagers. They'll do them every once in a while, but to really do them right, I mean, they're tying up your tank for eight to ten weeks. Uh, we make um, we make some higher gravity lagers like a Doppelbach and a Baltic Porter. Those will have to sit in there for ten weeks because they're ten percent beers, uh, so they need to hang out there for a while. Um, and a lot of places can't afford to tie up your tank that long. Uh, Highwire made it a priority very early on to be able to do that. So we do have a lot of fermentation space, um, specifically so we can make all of our ales, which we can pop out in two weeks time. Uh, but then we can actually sit on these really good lagers and let them fully just get super clean, super crisp, just we're doing it right. And I, that was the other aspect that really drew me to Highwire was the care that was going into these beers that if you really want to do them well you you just got to be careful and you got to take your time um so yeah i'm like so excited for oktoberfest yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds delicious um let's talk a little bit about uh the system can you okay. talk a little bit about the system that yeah. you guys have in the production absolutely that you guys are doing these um, days? so we have a 30 barrel brew house uh we have mostly 90 barrel tanks we have ni 19 90 barrel fermenters. Then we have a couple 60 barrels if we're doing slightly smaller batches. Um, so we have a 30 barrel brew house. It's also a four vessel brew house, which allows us to be super efficient. So we have a mash mixer, a louder ton, a kettle, and a whirlpool. Um, we've actually kind of, uh, we had our uh, welder come in and actually install separate lines so that just to make us more efficient, we used to only be able to brew three times in one day. It's me and one other brewer, that's yeah. it. Uh, we would brew three times in one day and that would fill up 190. Uh, we've up production even more and so now we can brew four times in one day and so we're actually able to start, uh, before we would, you start off in your mash mixer, go to your ladder, you run off into your kettle. Well that kind of takes up that, that's the longest bulk of time going from the ladder to the kettle. Well now, while uh, the kettle, once the kettle is full, we can actually start again and start running off into our mash mixer now. So we can just be continuously filling. Uh, it's, it's acting as a wort receiver. Yeah. So we're, um, we can just be continually running off beer. So we're just, there's no downtime anymore. Uh, so now that we're super efficient in the exact, uh, we're actually, it's the exact same amount of time as it was bring three batches as it is now bring four batches and still just me and one other dude. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how many barrels do y'all do usually like per year? Uh, last year, I think we were up to 15,000 barrels yeah. and I, that's just going to get more this year. I think now that we're doing these four batches, uh, we went through an expansion back in March. We added um, eight fermenters then. Oh, wow. So so we're expected to do a lot more it'll probably be yeah. close to 20,000 yeah and you guys do a lot of distribution here in the tap room but you bottle you mentioned yes. the bottle so line we're actually available in North Carolina South Carolina Tennessee um Georgia and uh Ohio uh, uh there uh, there's apparently a very large um vacation op uh it's popular to go from Cincinnati to Asheville it's apparently just a really hot Asheville's a hot spot <laughs> for Ohio people so like it was it was literally our bartenders going we're getting all these fucking people from cincinnati and they're like all right i guess we'll sell in ohio and and to be fair actually the um the distributor that we're working with in ohio like they they really wanted us and they really came after us so we were like all right cool we'll open ohio and we very i think a couple months ago we opened kentucky as well 
So we're getting there. So yeah. we distribute to all of those places. Um, we have, um, but we only bottle out of this facility. We bottle and can here. We just got our canning line back in March. Uh, so that's been fun to play with. Um, our canning, or sorry, our bottling line has been kind of Frankensteined together with old parts or like old machinery. Our filler is from the 70s. I want to say it's from 1975. Um, but we've got really smart dudes that can make that thing work um that was actually the the part about winning the gold medal for the um lager or for the oktoberfest it was really that it we didn't we didn't like make sure that one certain batch was really good and that like the one bottling run was like really good we literally just pulled the bottle off the bottling line and sent it off to gbf to be judged and it won. It was really just that our all of our processes were already that good. Um, that's what made everyone feel really great about that, that like everyone had a hand in it and everyone was doing their job correctly and that's why that beer won. Um, so yeah, even though there can be some pretty old equipment out there, we know how to make it work. Um, our centrifuge is so old it literally says made in West Germany on it. <laughs> it's, I think it's Westphalia. <laughs> Um, that thing's pretty old too, but uh, my husband's a cellarman here and the, the man knows how to make that kitty purr, so <laughs> works <Go> out. <laughs> yeah, so this, is, this may not even have an answer, mm -hmm. but what would you say, like, what's a typical brewing cycle look like around here? Because <sighs> um, you probably don't have a typical day. Uh, I do on the brewing side, so the... Uh, I, I don't know how typical our situation is. We are very separated in our departments. Mm. I work exclusively hot side. Like I will brew the beer and as soon as I'm done knocking out, it's the seller's problem. And then, you know, it, it, I mean, we all talk to each other to make sure that what we're doing, how it affects everyone down the line. Um, but in a lot of other breweries, you might switch off, like maybe you'll brew for two weeks and then you'll go work in the cellar for a couple of weeks or, you know, you'll switch it around. Um, we're all a little bit specialized here. Um, and so for, for most of us, at least here at Highwire, we actually do kind of do, I typically come in at 2.30. Um, I do the last brew and a half and then I have to do uh, a clean. Um, that's typically what I'll do. Me and my other brewer will we'll switch from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but really for us, we're exclusively brewing. And then if you're in the cellar, you are cleaning tanks and centrifuge and transferring beer and dry hopping beer. You know, if you're in packaging, you're doing like, it is, it can get a little, um, you know, you're in your little box, uh, but everyone who's doing what they're doing is also really good at what they're doing so there's a trade-off there yeah. like like i really know how to fix my brew house very quickly if something's going awry i can fix it really quickly because i do it every single day so it makes this place super efficient um yeah i think that's <laughs> yeah, that makes sense mm -hmm. um so what would you say is your favorite part of brewing oh that's so hard i know it's a very difficult question you know, I'm going to take it even just like on the really, really tiny level of like, there's nothing quite like if you've got a really good bag of hops and you slice it up a fresh open bag and just like, if it's just comes flying out of you. We had this batch of Simcoe recently. It was just like pure grapefruit. And every time I was like excited every time I opened it, I was just like, oh my God, it smells so good. Um, I, I know that's like on like the tiniest level, but like, I think you kind of really have to appreciate it. I mean, because this job can get really hard. I like that it's hard. I am a very, I, I couldn't sit at a computer all day. I would lose my damn mind. Um, I, the very first job I had out of college was I worked at the Philadelphia Zoo working with draft horses. I was working like, I would walk 16 miles a day. I would have to shovel like crap. And like, I was like the happiest I ever was. Because I, if, I, if I go home and I'm not gross and exhausted, then I feel like I didn't do anything. So <laughs> I'm in the correct industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So really, it's just kind of like, I, I like this. I like being physical. And this is a very physical job. So uh, if, if you're not a physical person, this is not the job for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So is there a piece that you would say is your, like, what's, what's the bane of your brewing existence? Oh, God. I mean, it just, when something, there's nothing like a slow or stuck mash. Like, when that happens, I just want to kill everything. <laughs> I get so mad. And I'll be like, because I'm usually pretty good at, like, freeing it up I'm like and when I can't I get so frustrated like my husband will be walking by I was like you want to get lunch I'm like I can't get lunch right now he's like all right it's fine it's gonna be okay <laughs> and then it feels good when I can free it up and I'm like yeah I got you <laughs> but oh god when I have a stuck mash I'm I am not a pleasant person to talk to <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness so um you know how how are was as you mentioned kind of like an established yeah. brand mm -hmm. when you came in yeah how do you kind of merge that with your own personal interest in brewing philosophy well I'm glad the two align <laughs> pretty well um I like I said like, like I said I I like trends as they are every once in a while and I like the high wire will pay attention to that but that in the end in the end it's all really about making really good clean beer um, that I get really disheartened sometimes when I'll go to other breweries and it just seems like it just got pumped out as fast as they could and it if you just took a little bit more time with it a little bit more care into it if you could find someone in your brewery that can taste diacetyl something like you know just these are all very small mistakes that I think a lot of small craft breweries, they just either don't have the education or the capabilities to make it better or the patience to make it better. Um, it, that can be really frustrating. And so luckily, I think the reason that Highwire has done so well is because they do care about those little things. They, uh, they do care about, you know, uh, oh, I mean, I'll even say like uh, one of our more recent batches of lager something's was a little bit off and like i i kind of appreciate the fact that we all kind of take that hit like we're all kind of like feel it like everyone drink this beer ever let's talk about what happened let's figure out what went wrong and like not just sweep it under the rug does that make sense um so it was i think that this was my first real job coming out of the brewing industry maybe it did help shape where i wanted to go but just my personal beliefs in how beer should be run, how it should be marketed. Highwire was already going that direction anyway. So I think I, I think I just really lucked out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, we mentioned, we were talking about pink boots a mm -hmm. little while ago. Um, can you talk a little bit about pink boots? I know statewide, we're starting to see kind of chapters popping yeah. up in different cities. Can you talk a little bit about how kind of the localized pink boots yeah. is working around so, here? So uh, we actually just had our first um, meeting last week. Yay. So we had our first meeting last week. Um, uh, I am the secretary for the local chapter. Um, our two uh, main, cha our two chapter leaders are Leah Reynas and Katie Smith. Um, it was good. Our first initial meeting was really just trying to figure out who's here <laughs> and what they want to get out of it. Um, we do have a lot of really cool resources nearby. Uh, we have Riverbend Malting Company. There's a woman who works there, so we can get her perspective. Uh, one of the women in Pink Boots works at uh, White Labs, the yeast provider here in town. Um, so she's going to do like educational classes on that. And so uh, the local actual chapter is still getting started. Um, like I said, it was really just our first meeting, but it is really exciting. Uh, uh, several students both from the AP Tech program and the Blue Ridge program uh, showed up which was awesome uh, it was really cool to talk to one of the girls she was a little bit like me like she I, I didn't I didn't I never homebrewed um, I hate homebrewing I've done it twice in my life and I fucking hate it because <laughs> it makes my whole house dirty and I just hate it <laughs> I'd rather do it here and it's clean and it's not in my way and it's fine I hate homebrewing uh, so, but this one girl, she's starting in the fall and she's coming from like a pharmaceutical background. She actually, she was like, I literally just did this. I'm going to see how it works out. And so like, it was cool to talk to her and actually kind of calm her down a little bit. And uh, I was like, well, you know, maybe you should focus on lab work because um, breweries need that nowadays. A lot more, that's becoming a really necessary thing for craft breweries. Um, 
it was really cool to get all these different perspectives and it was cool to give advice too. I, I, I am getting to that point in my career where like, I mean like, yeah, I do know what the hell I'm doing. I know what should be happening around here. And so to be able to actually help others, that's been really fun. And then to meet people who, who know more than I do and ex can explain things to me, um, that's been really exciting. So uh, we've got cool ideas. Like we want to go out to Fontaflora, uh, that area, and go like foraging for beer ingredients. Um, maybe taking a self-defense class. I think that would be really important. I mean, like I'm, oh, I'm almost always here super late by myself. So like, I mean, I'm a tough girl from Philly. I'm all right, but. <laughs> Some bartender, like uh, Pink Boots is also open to like bartenders, like wanting to like, uh, having a beer tender is like a career now. I mean, that can be a thing, helping them get uh, Cicerone, um, really just helping women in their careers around here. Uh, I'm really excited to see what we can do. I'm, I'm super pumped about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you kind of hinted at this in that answer, but can you talk about some of the challenges that come with being a woman in this industry? Um, yeah, it, I do consider myself a little a little lucky because I haven't had to deal with the overt sexism. Um, like I've never had to deal with like oh you know women brewer or even just at, I've never had to deal with that. But I mean every single t we have tours daily here at Highwire. Every single tour that comes through, it's kind of like oh it's a girl brewing. Like it, it you know it's not a malicious thing, but it's just clearly we're still a novelty and when you're still in that realm you can still kind of feel like you're not being taken completely seriously so like I said it's not a malicious overt sexism thing that I'm I've ever dealt with that doesn't mean that doesn't exist um, it still does and it sucks uh, a friend of mine that a prominent brewery in Oregon she really couldn't move up and blatantly because the owner told her because she was a woman that still happens today and that's really frustrating I've locked out and that's never been an issue for me, but it really is those little, it's clearly just not common knowledge that girls can do this. Um, I, I personally take a little bit of joy in that. Oh, like I like to kind of give people a hard time when they do come through. Uh, although it can get really annoying. Like I'll be up on the brew deck in my full brew gear and they'd be like, oh, is that the sales girl? And I'll be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, really? So, like, those ones can get a little frustrating, but just the offhand ones of, like, oh, it's a girl brewing. And then they're like, that's cool. And then from now on, it's a normal thing for them. So, like, we need to be more visible and to be a little bit more out there. Um, one thing I never, I don't know, I've always been kind of very empowered in whatever I want to do. My my dad can't build shit, but my mom can do anything. I came home one day and she had like a deck built. Like my dad can't fix anything, he's useless, but my mom can fix everything in the house. So like, I think I just had this, this person, like just like, of course women can do this. Like I, I, she built her own house when she was like 25. So like, uh, that was what I grew up with. So that's what I was used to. So I never really understood. I was, I just never put that own stereotype on myself. I didn't think that was even a thing. Um, so it was a little weird when people were like, oh, you're doing that? That's super strange. But uh, one of our owners here at Highwire, he has a five-year-old daughter. And then she's five, she, and this is a very like ridiculous environment, so she doesn't come around very often. But she knows Highwire, and she knows what we do, and everything. she understands that. And I guess I didn't know this, but every Sunday he would bring her in uh, while the tap room was still closed and she could like run around and we had like fish back here and stuff. So she wanted to go do that. That was like their father-daughter outing. And I was here cleaning uh, one day, just up on the brew house. And um, she like talked to me a little bit and she like wanted to like take pictures of me up there. And I was, he was like, okay. And he came into me the next week and he was like, you're her hero. He was like, she didn't like, she like was like, is she like brewing? And he was like, yeah. And so she still like, whenever she wants to like flip through the pictures, she wants to see pictures of me up on the brew deck. And like, he told me that story and I was just like, damn, like that's awesome. Like I didn't, just being visible for girls 
to just see that you can do whatever the hell that you want. The, she had no concept of that before, but now that she saw me up there brewing, she probably won't go into the brewing industry, but it might think that she can do something else that maybe a lot of boys can do. So I don't know, I, there was a while, that was my kind of transition from maybe, you know, not trying to make a big deal that I was a woman in the brewing industry to being like, oh, that's why it's important. It, that, that was kind of my like, my, my light bulb moment. I was yeah. like, that was awesome. And to tie it in with pink boots, I mean, that's where something like Beard of Femme can really. Yeah, and that, that's, been, that's been really huge too. And actually Beard of Femme was the first like all women's beer festival in the country, which was really cool. And so now uh, Pink Boots nationally is meeting with the Beard of Femme girls to like try to make that, to see how they did the layout and everything and try to make, have that replicated in other areas which is freaking awesome and really just you know you have an entire brew festival and it's shocking how many women there are and I also like the Beard of Femme Festival because it encourages all the women from the brewery to be a part of making that beer for Beard of Femme um, so I mean yeah when we do it here at High Wire of course I make the recipe and I do the bulk of like some of the brewing stuff but like our event coordinator will come uh, one of our owners is a woman uh, our accountant like all of these women that will work within the brewery maybe they, they don't have to be a brewer to really come together we uh, we made a Belgian strong this year so as we were brewing you know we popped open a couple Belgian strong bottles for everyone to taste like what that style is supposed to be like what I was trying to go for um, yeah that's uh, it's cool to see that's the other aspect of Tink Boots is that it's not just about production it's anyone within the beer industry um, the more you know about beer in general it's going to help you in your career over here so I like that I like that aspect of, of Pink Boots a lot it's cool I'm glad it's not just production girls <laughs> no. well I think it's a good introduction for folks to just see that there are that, that many breweries with Absol that many women. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that um, most places now do have at least one woman in production. I, I, I was even shocked when I went to Beer to Femme. Um, that was the other reason I always kind of always felt a little weird about even doing interviews and stuff like this because I'm like, well, I'm not the only girl that's fucking doing this. Uh, it's really nice that like now we're as a group, we're all kind of getting a voice and getting these places to showcase that we exist and that we're kicking ass doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if we had, uh, you know, you mentioned this with the, the student that you talked to at the Pink mm -hmm. Boots meeting, but if somebody wandered in right now, well, a, a woman wandered in right now and was like, I want to get into the production side of brewing. What's, what advice would you give her? Go to school. Um, go to school. It, mostly, be, and the reason I really like the AB Tech program is because they, you have to have that internship. Um, like you'll get all of the scientific background that you really need. Um, when I was in, when I was at school, like I said, we were still like the guinea pigs and like all the equipment was still being installed and like all of this crap. Um, so you won't, it's not like you're going to brew on a 30 barrel brew house at school. That's just not how it's going to work out. But you're going to get, you know, the science behind everything that's happening, which a lot of, if a lot of these guys that go from home brewing to just starting a brewery, they might miss some of that nuanced stuff. Um, you're going to get that. You're also, I think that the more that you understand the beer industry as a whole, it's going to help you even in like in production. Like just, uh, I went on a um, sales call with one of our sales reps and just learning what he does and how he needs to pitch the beer like learning all of those little aspects of the industry is just going to make you better at your job um so because something like the ab tech program it is so well-rounded you're going to get all of those but really it comes down to that internship because yeah a lot of people are like wow being a brewer is so cool yeah it's cool but like you get your ass kicked and if you don't like getting your ass kicked this isn't for you and so it's really a rude wake-up call for um a bunch of for a bunch of people um yeah. I, I mean like it sucks whenever we do get a female intern like i feel like i'm always like kind of rooting for her a little bit more and and so it's and it's not because she's a woman it's because she's like this this isn't fun and i'm like if it's not fun for you it's just it's not for you i get guys saying the exact same thing so really 
but before you go like leaping into it to have this internship to like really kick your ass see if it's something that you actually really do love i think that's so important yeah um yeah that's the biggest thing i think yeah <laughs> that make that makes perfect <laughs> sense um so we're gonna ask you the question that is the hardest question it seems for every brewer to answer okay what's your favorite beer from a north carolina brewery other than your own oh I have to pick one. I know the brewery. I'm just trying to think which one I, I want. And you, can, you can go with the brewery. We'll go okay. we'll off easy. Um, right now, my favorite brewery in North Carolina is a place called Zillacoa. Um, it is. It started by uh, a guy named John Parks, who used to be our specialty brewer here at Highwire. He did all of our sours and wild ales, and he branched off to um, start his own place. Uh, his, the guy just understands beer everything he makes is so good he makes this patters beer that is just like so fucking delicious he made a vienna lager that was awesome um it's that it's that attention to detail and like like not just pushing a beer out to push a beer out it is he gets really intense with his beer like i mean that's why some of the best beers i've my favorite high water beers came from him yeah. um he's always been someone i've kind of looked up to just just the how into it he gets um, but all of his beers are so good. Go to Zilicoa. <laughs> There's also a taco truck there that are the best tacos you'll ever have in your entire life. So like, it's just a great experience. You can sounds, take your dog. Sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you've mentioned the, the flagships and everything. What, what's your favorite beer to drink? Not necessarily to brew, but what's your favorite? Uh, on a regular basis of our flagships the lager um i think and i always do think that is kind of funny because I, I like i said earlier if someone comes in off the street that's only ever been drinking bud light they could drink this and not be offended well guess what it's what all of the brewers here are drinking all of the time like i everyone kind of goes through their progression of like what beers they like i think i was into my weird beers kind of early on in my beer education I think uh, we would always vacation really close to where Dogfish Head is. Yeah. And so, like, growing up, I just, like, uh, weird beers were right there all the time. So I kind of got that out of my, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love sours. I love weird-ass beers. But everyone kind of comes back to, I just want a lager, or I just want a brown. And, yeah, so lager all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to have a good solid exactly. one to go back and to. Then, and then as much as I was geeking out over the Oktoberfest, any, any lager. Oktoberfest, our Doppelbach is so good. <laughs> lagers, I like lagers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that folks have been telling us is that lagers seem to be kind of the new trending beer too. I hope so. Yeah. I, well, mostly because I want to drink other people's. Like, <laughs> I love mine, it's great. Um, but it is cool to, uh, to see what other people are doing with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just like to see breweries get better at it um to, to, that when they start realizing that they need to take their time with it and everything it's cool to see people grow that way a lager is to me is a really good way to tell how well that brewery is doing because it takes so much time and care you can't just cover up the flavor with a shit ton of hops i mean i guess you could but like whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so you know one question that kind of popped up in my head mm -hmm. um you know, you were in Oregon before deciding to come back here, but yeah. you weren't doing production there, right? No, no, I was just in the tasting room. But there. can you kind of compare, is there a way to compare kind of the Oregon environment to here? I mean, those are two, <sighs> the, they seem to be very different beer cultures. It is very different beer cultures. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, what happens on the West, when things get popular here, aside from the hazy IPA, the hazy IPA, the New England style beer and that's been an East Coast thing but typically I have noticed that if there's a beer trend it starts in California Oregon Washington and it will make its way east um, one of the other really the beer like the fresh hops out there really taste different like uh, North Carolina just we're not a great spot to grow hops so like if you want to make a fresh hop beer it just it's not going to be the same as if you can do a fresh hop beer out there. Like uh, there is definitely, if it, if it only takes 50 miles from the Willamette Valley to get some, you know, it's, it's going to be a little bit fresher. Um, so I do think that the trends will start there and come out this way. I think right now, like 
the champagne style of beer is really popular out there right now and it's starting to come this way actually the Asheville pink boots um, made that was our uh, our like International Women's Day beer that we made this year was a, a champagne style hot beer um, but I, I do think sometimes on the East Coast we're, we're catching up a little bit with the trends um, which is I mean whatever it's fine yeah. I do think that the average beer drinker and consumer out there is maybe a little bit more knowledgeable um, than the average one I've met out here we're still kind of trying to get people back on was like we actually did a, ta a like a test with our logger one time we wanted to see if we could shorten the amount of time that we could logger it just to see you never know um and so we actually did it at like we tasted it like four weeks six weeks and eight weeks and we brought in people who were not brewers just like average people like taste it and they would say that the ones that were like at four weeks and six weeks those had issues with it like i mean that's what we as brewers perceive as um, but to them it tasted more craft because it was off and like I think that that's still an issue that we're, we're getting better at in North Carolina but it still needs to it we're, it's still something we're working on um, I like I said earlier when my brewmaster said he's gonna ruin beer for me he did because I, I really do struggle to kind of go around sometimes and like not nitpick but um, I think now the average beer consumer is getting smarter here, right? like, or at least learning what makes constitutes a good clean beer. And now that that's happening, I think now that we're we're starting to catch up. I yeah. think that, I think that's only good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so, what kind of things do you like to do when you're not brewing? <laughs> um, I uh, do have two dogs, my babies, and we're really big outdoorsy people. So we're camping every weekend. We are, oh, we're hiking, backpacking. We, I never slow down. It's really bad. Like on our honeymoon, everyone was like, oh, you're gonna go lay on a beach somewhere? I'm like, no, we trekked throughout Zion and like Grand Staircase Escalante. So like, if I, like I said, I always like to be tired. <laughs> um, we're really bad about just like staying still. So just doing stuff outdoors, all the time we're about to my husband's really into rock climbing he's about to get me into rock climbing i'm a little scared but it's gonna be great um i am a really i did study music in college for a long time i i thought i was going to be an opera singer actually for a very very long time uh so i still just kind of practice that i was in the Asheville symphony choir here for uh, a while until I, I switched my shift so i can't be at rehearsals all the time um but like singing classical music that's uh that's my deal. <laughs> that's very <laughs> cool. Yep. Yeah. So um, that's pretty much the end of the questions I came with. Is there cool. anything we didn't talk about that you want to talk about in order to kind of get the big picture of you uh, and your place in the industry? I don't think so. Okay. I think I got everything. <laughs> that's okay. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you absolutely. so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>